we have here. Look who we have here. The Dynasty Trades and Five Boys. Welcome to the Mind of Mansion. Thanks for having us. Scott. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> Scott's like, Scott's yeah. like, we don't do intros. Like, where, where's the, where's the question? Yeah, intros about? throw me off, but it's all good. <laughs> yeah, the, no, yeah, we're not. We're getting right into it. No more, no formalities. You know, that's we don't. One of one of the one of the my my initial sort of uh, you know positions that I took was that we're not doing formalities. We're not doing welcome to the show and a whole setup and all that stuff. We get right into it. What do you what do you guys think of this uh, this uh, this whole uh, wide receiver class? Where where would you rank it in the last ten years? I think it's going to destroy dynasty. This year's root receiver class is going to destroy dynasty. It's that good, right? I I don't think it's it's really good, but I also think it's going to break a lot of people's processes in terms of how they view receivers. We're going to see hits coming from the third and fourth round. We're going to see busts coming from the first and second round. I think we're going to leave this receiver class questioning a lot of what we think we know about how to evaluate receivers. Uh, and I think at the end of this year, we're going to start looking at things that we didn't look at previously at receiver quarterbacks, landing spots, offensive coordinators, situations are going to matter a lot more than analytical profiles, age, college production. Not that those things won't matter, but I think a lot of what we saw last year with Puka and Tank Dell is just going to continue this year because there's going to be good profiles that go to shitty spots. There's going to be bad players that go to good spots. And then we're going to see a saturation in Dynasty because where there's there's just tons of receivers. Guys like Zay Flowers, Jaden Reed, Rasheed Rice, those dudes could just get lost. They're just guys very sure. quickly. You know, they're replaceable. Hell, they're, they're already be A guy like Josh Downs, good prospect, good player, means everything jack shit if you have them in a league nobody wants them nobody would probably give you a pick inside the top 20 this year for josh downs because they can just pick another no need one. to no need to Correct. well we i mean we had uh in terms of fantasy points per game we had five guys go over 20 fantasy points per game last year that was it right so Got to get those hammers right. There, there's the 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 best the best guys. You know, Tyree Kill gave you like twenty three and a half fantasy points per game. That's a real difference maker. But the wide receiver position is so deep that it 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 may be it may come to pass that the handful of running backs that actually are putting up twenty fantasy points become more valuable than they've been in a long time if the wide receiver position is so deep and it's so easy to acquire a guy that's going to get you 14 fantasy points a game. That's where you're going with this, right? It's like the American dollar. What happens when they just print a trillion dollars and throw it out into circulation, yeah. right? The dollars you have are worth less. Yeah, the, in the inflation. Yeah, it's, 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 it's becoming <laughs> that at receiver to where, Matt, you're right. I mean, two of those guys that didn't, hit difference-making numbers last year. Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson did it twice before this. So they're already like, they're they're still being bet on to get to that range. And then you have others, some of them are older. But I, I, yeah, I think you're totally right. And I think it leads to how we approach these rookie drafts. Because you go through and you do a mock. If we did a mock today, we'd probably draft, what, a dozen receivers between the 109 and the 306, at least. And what would we Likely. say every time? Ah, man, that guy's going to get good draft capital. He's got a good profile. He's going to go in the mid-second, so I just got to take him because he's there at the 207. And then you go, am I just drafting another Josh Downs? Am I just drafting maybe I'm maybe 90th percentile outcome as I hit on another Zay Flowers or another Tank Dell? Like That's best-case scenario for a lot of them, but yet we do a mock. We're just going to keep hitting them and hitting them and hitting them, and then – what happens to guys like Marquise Brown if he doesn't produce? He goes from wide receiver 40 to dead. Jerry Judy doesn't hit right away. Jerry Judy. Away. Yeah. I believe you brought up Jerry Judy already, man. It's too early in the morning for Jerry Judy. Marquise Brown, Jerry Judy, Deontay Johnson. They were already getting lost in the shuffle. All three have new life. Isn't there going to be an eclipse in like a week? There is. Yeah, there, there, there is. is. 
I, sounds I just, like, I'm sounds curious. like the wide receivers in the NFL. <laughs> I, I'm just curious how this when when is the dam going to break? Because Matt Matt nailed the point. How hard is it to find a 14 point per game receiver? Now there's certain formats. If you're playing in deep best ball leagues, like you need a lot of those innings eaters to get there. But they're not scarce. They're not an asset where if you hit on a rookie pick at 112 and you hit on a Zay Flowers, I keep bringing that name up, but he seems like the prototypical poster yes. child of this. If you sure. hit on him, what did you hit on if you drafted him at the one? You got a really good player, I can tell you that you right now. You got a good you player. On, you got, you that's the thing about Zay Flowers. He's format. so good. He's good. He's but you so could good, also... and it feels so good in Dynasty to have great players on your team. But, but then what do you what do you do with him if you're trying to leverage something that has even more power? And barring you can't add to him to go and get a better receiver. A lot of times those types of trades are hard to do. But how can I turn one of those receivers that I took a swing at and it was a success into something that moves the needle? I think that's the discussion, and maybe it changes how we approach rookie drafts. You don't want to hit on a bust. I don't want to draft a Jalen Rager. I don't want to draft a quarterback that busts or a running back like Tank Bigsby who sucks. But <laughs> but if I just draft a good receiver, what do I ultimately end up with other than just a placeholder? For many Value years. Insulation. Value for insulation. If you're, if you're going to get a wide receiver who's going to be part of this cluster, you know, you mentioned a cluster. Zay Flowers was a good example. At least you want that type because they still have some liquidity. If they're not going to be a difference maker in terms of actual production, Fantasy wise, then that's one thing, but they have to be a liquid, likable name. That's just, I, I'm very curious to see how rookie drafts are going to go. Like once we get to the 108 through, call it 201, are people bailing to vets? And what does that look like? Where does Devontae Adams come into play? If you're a contender and you have your own first, the 112, or are you dropping that on them? I'm very curious to see what the movement's going to be like on draft day. Well, I've seen rookie drafts where no running backs were drafted in the first round. Have you guys seen those? Oh, most. Most of them. Right? And it, and, and yeah. you're like, oh, this is most. I see one and I'm shocked. Because I'm like, you got to understand, like, it wasn't that many years ago where there were as many running backs drafted in the first round as receivers. Sometimes more. It wasn't that long ago there were more. And now I know this is a great wide receiver class and it's a very underwhelming running back class. So and that combined with the you know the movement that we're seeing in the NFL, the philosophical change in offense where there's more passing and there's more efficiency through the passing game and there's you know less running backs that are getting workhorse touches. Understand all that, but still, it's still jarring if 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 you if if you're me and I'm like, "Well, if I'm at the 111, 112, I'm looking at the the profile of receiver X that's going here. And like you said, with this class, you know, there's a lot of great players in this class. It's harder to sift them out than it has been in previously using metrics like dominator rating. Good luck with Adonai Mitchell, with Ladd McConkey. We know those are good receivers, but they don't have the dominator rating they don't have some of the, the the key data points that would suggest oh this guy is going to be a hit in the nfl and like you said last year with puka nakua and others we've started to see it more and more and like that that was the thing when i when i looked at the profiles of the top 10 receivers in this class i was like oh yeah th just like scott mentioned this is just building on a trend we've seen where we're leaning more on what we saw at the senior bowl and the combine than ever. Here's what I'm hoping for. And I think it's going to be big to determine how to order these receivers. But I do think to one of your points, Matt, right now, if you did a mock, everyone's scared of the running backs because they don't know who's going to land where, and they don't know necessarily oh. who's going to get the draft capital. Oh. But there's going, there's going to be one or two running backs that rise above the rest and people are going to be very tempted to pick them. There's going to be a couple quarterbacks, whether you like them or not. Prediction, we're going to get two quarterbacks in the second round that are drafted to be starters. Now, whether you think they're good or not, somebody's going to take Bo Nix, somebody's going to take Michael Penix, and they're going to probably go to teams. You don't use a second-round pick on a quarterback to go, he's our backup. He's going to get a live shot probably this year to start. 
And then you look at what what ha- I'm going to I want to pose this to the pod father. What happens if the <laughs> first round receivers after the big 3 mm-hmm. go to Miami, Philadelphia and Green Bay? If there's even that many. Well, let's just assume there's 3. There's six receivers in the first and we're excluding okay. Marv Neighbors and Adunze. Right. But the other three first round spots are Miami, Philadelphia, and Green Bay. At that point, you can't just go draft capital, right? Do you really want the Eagles number three receiver? Yeah, I was about to say gross, gross, and ah. okay. <laughs> and then you look at round two and you see a, a receiver land in New England with Drake May. You, you got to be a little intrigued. He's probably the best receiver on the team from the rip, right? Right. Uh, somebody goes to Carolina, probably interested. Somebody goes to Washington, the Chargers. You know, there's Arizona a- takes another. There's a lot of landing spots in the early round two where you're immediately going to go, man, I, it's hard for me to draft A.D. Mitchell to the Dolphins when Lad oh, McConkey went to New England. Do you know what I mean? Oh. Just, just saying, people are going to talk themselves into, they're going to ignore everything. When you pull up these, these metrics on player profile, they're going to ignore all that shit and go, Give me the guy that's going to get targets right away. And that's I a think, product of the fact that they're it's easy to find receive. I think the problem there, though, if I can just chime in, is for me personally, and, and I think a lot of a lot about the like likability and league economy when it comes to a player. I think there's going to be like a, a stink, a year stink at least on the Patriots, even though, you know, there's a lot of things that have moved on. They might draft a quarterback. I just, I see it being stinky. So that player better hit for, for me, you rang off a couple other teams where I was like, meh, you know, that'd be okay. Uh, Chargers obviously would be a good one, but don't you, you don't think there's going to be a Patriot stink at all. And, and Panthers. Yes. I mean, you, somebody has to get the targets, right? And Dio John is a target hog historically, but what do you think about that? No. You remember the 2020 draft, Clay? Remember the no stink that was on the Bengals <laughs> the year before when they draft Joe Burrow and then they draft T. Higgins? What if that's the Patriots this year? I like guess two- I just don't like the Patriots. Maybe that's part of it. You uh, I should have I should have baked that in. I, I I think that this is a good point. You don't trust the Patriots because you just remember the Patriots of old. It's the same thing that follows the Titans. I still hear, oh man, the Titans are a bad spot for a receiver. Is it? You may not think their quarterback's great. But for everything we've seen, they're going to run an entire – it's a whole new team. You sure, can't sure. even look at the name Tennessee Titans and think Derrick Henry, throw it 450 times a game or a year. It's going to be a totally different offense. I have to assume we have to give the Patriots the benefit of the doubt. Well, they, what, you know? the Titans have a bust receiver and a 31-year-old receiver, and they've, <laughs> they've made the conscious decision to be a satellite back only destination backfield. Mm-hmm. So what does that tell you? They want to invest in satellite backs and they want to invest in receivers and they already have a quarterback that they picked at the top of the second round with a big arm. That tells you they want to throw the ball and throw the ball downfield. That sounds like an exciting place to go if exactly. what you know w- w- would be an, an absolute improbable event of Traylon Burks hitting. Uh, especially after the comments at the Combine where they talked about him as if he was a developmental receiver. And if you're a first-round pick and you're considered a developmental receiver after two years, it is over. You are Nikhil Harry. That's it. Goodbye. Talk about New England receivers, right? That And by the way, uh, people were drafting Nikhil Harry high enough, oh, right? No Plenty high. There was no Patriots stake with Nikhil Harry, if I remember correctly. So... I especially, especially should they draft a quarterback, if they draft a J.J. McCarthy or a Drake May and the new coaching staff and the hollowed out wide receiver room, that's all anyone's going to think about. There's going to be zero stink, zero stink. And I remember for many years, my strategy in Superflex was hammer quarterback in the first round, hammer receiver in the second round. You know, you mentioned T. Higgins. Once upon a time, remember, T. Higgins was the 201 or 202 in Superflex. Remember those days? Right? Michael Pittman, 203. You remember these days, right? Sure, So those are pretty good picks, right? And then just, you know, 
every time I drafted a receiver instead of a running back in round two, three, four, five, or three, four, five, I should say, in round three, four, five, I was I was mad. I'd be like, I just ate a zero at receiver with this third round guy that I talked myself into. But I if I if I had thrown three darts on running back, I would have hit. I would have I would have got at least one hit every time. You're gonna get at least one hit on an Aaron Jones. Right in those rounds, I think we might be back. That may be, but for different reasons. The reasons back then were different. The reasons now is that you actually wouldn't want a receiver in round three, four, five because the goddamn position is so saturated that finding a difference maker now is damn near impossible in those rounds. You might have run really, really hot last year. And let's say you drafted Michael Wilson. You drafted Demario Douglas. You drafted Trey Palmer. You drafted Dontavian Wicks. You're feeling good, right? You didn't waste those picks. Those were essentially, you just listed a whole bunch of fourth and fifth round hits. Correct. Those are hits. But here's the thing. If you're playing in a lineup dynasty league, not a best ball. Best ball, you know what? I hit on those guys. I'm probably taking a lot of shots in this class in best ball because I don't give a shit if they only give me 600 yards for a season. If they give me two weeks, it's worth a pick. But if you have those players I named in a lineup league right now, go go try to put them on your auto accept trade block. Hey, man, anybody give me a third rounder for these guys. It'd be crickets. Yeah, it has to be a start start 16 league maybe. And, Um. and, And that's not where most people are playing. They're playing in start 10, start 11, you put those guys on the block, and it's like, I hope to find a fish in the lake that will bite my bait and take these guys off my team so that I now have a 302, and maybe I can fix my mistake this year and draft a running back or draft a backup quarterback instead. But we saw it last year. Receiver hits came from every. I mean, all those guys I mentioned were all better than Quentin Johnston. But I think the interesting thing that we've starting to see on receivers, and I know Matt's not a fan of Quentin Johnston, neither are we. I'm trades in five. I don't. I don't know anybody. Who, who loves Quentin, Who loves Quentin? Quentin oh, Johnston. people or even likes him. People oh, did, but I have here's the receipts. Some did, but here's the. I think the general consensus is we're starting to see this phenomenon happen as well. You don't have well. First of all, if you're drafting a guy like Quentin Johnston. This year, it's probably Keon Coleman. You need to be aware that 90% of people think he sucks before he even goes anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So as soon as you hit draft, you do not have really any artificial dynasty value. I'll shout out to Ray. That's his term that he coined. The ADV. If you're drafting players that have that stink on them, they you, must now have one, you have one out. Hopefully, they're good. Yeah. And yeah. Even, even if they're good in spurts, Quentin Johnston could start this season off with a couple good games. Oh, man, he's still not good. Like, what it takes for people to buy back in to receivers and how quickly we are able to give up on a receiver that's not great right away. Matt, you mentioned some names. Traylon Burks, Nikhil Harry, Rashad Bateman even, Jamison Williams still. You used to be able to sell on these guys a year or two after they busted. Even Jalen Rager after an awful first year Mm. you were able to sell them for 60 70 cents on what you paid because some dummy is willing to go ah man it was just this 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 and this that says he's gonna break out in year two so even if you drafted him you were able to get out you knew the knife was falling and about to land on your leg (laughs) and you were still able to sell now like a guy like quentin johnston it's almost not even worth selling it's funny you can't sell him you get 10% what you paid. You get a third rounder, and you're almost like, I would rather just bank that he does anything to yeah. maybe I could get yeah. a second because the the value went from 100% to 10% after a failed year. And it feels like we're going to get a lot of those in this class too. I might, be, I might like be acquiring right. some Quentin Johnston this year. I might be getting some Quentin Johnston I, as a throw-in, and I'm fine I with agree. that. I'm fine with that. I, I, don't, I don't hate players. I just hate ADPs. And I, you know, and I, I think that the Chargers clearly – think something about him they don't he's, hate him 100 percent because they, 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 they've decided to clear him. clear everybody out so he has an opportunity this year he has an opportunity to do something in week one two three four and if he does whatever that valuation is at that moment is going to be higher than it was in the offseason yep so I, there is a phenomenon that you mentioned when you talk about best ball and there are more and more be, dynasty best ball leagues which is great I do believe that 
the underdog format may be affecting Dynasty. Just straight up Dynasty Leagues, where you set your lineup, right? Where this format of start three receivers, two flex positions, best ball. Yeah, if you tell me you start three receivers with two flex, full PPR, best ball, okay. You know, these Josh Downs is really valuable in that format. Hello? I want the hell out of Josh Downs. Give me all the Josh Downs in that format. You give me a format where it's, you know, you start two receivers with a flex, something more traditional. I'm also, you know, setting my lineup every week. That's a completely different ball game, but that's most dynasty leagues. But now with with best ball starting in February, that ADP and those valuations are affecting dynasty startups. They're affecting rookie drafts for dynasty, and and I do believe that that has an impact and it creates a a, a buying opportunity outside the wide receiver position in dynasty. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned uh, like FFPC, for instance, if you play dynasty there, you know, they have to cut down the 16 players. You look at your roster and you go, man, I feel good about that. Josh downs that I take in the last, you know, last pick of the third round last year. Then you look at who somebody cut in your league. Ah, oh, man, someone cut like Elijah Moore. Are they really that different? You know what I mean? Like you think you're you're hitting with Josh Downs, then you look at the the, the rookie draft combined with the vets, and you're going, man, about fifteen receivers that are in the same zone got cut. So no, like no, really I know because this is happening that. to me. This is happening to you. Like I got Michael Wilson. I love Michael Wilson. Hmm. I believe in Michael Wilson. I think there's real upside there, but we haven't seen it yet. And we know the Cardinals are going to draft a receiver, and he, so he could he's, probably two. He's three, probably, and then the, that he's going to be looking at you know the the wide receiver three position heading into twenty twenty four, and you're like, eh, I'm not sure I love this anymore, uh, and you have to make it make a hard decision in the FFPC. You're like, I hit on a receiver, I'm so happy about it, I'm cutting him. So Matt, what's the takeaway though? Because I think a lot of people are listening to this, and they will continue to draft. The Michael Wilsons continue to draft the Josh Downs because they'll probably justify there's not anything better to take at the time, but they don't see the future. They don't see the plan of, all right, basically you drafted Michael Wilson. You were hoping, A, that he was a good player, but if you weren't able to move him during the season, really what you were hoping for was that he was a great player and you'd be able to actually flip him for a profit. But now that you didn't and you end up cutting him, what was the point? And now I look at my team this year and I have two thirds, two fourths, two fifths. And I go, what the hell do I do with them besides draft the next Michael Wilson, the next Josh Downs, the next Trey Palmer, the next Demario Douglas? Like, wh what do you change now that we're seeing this? And I'm talking to the people that are in shallower leagues. Not everybody plays leagues with 35 man rosters and start 13 best ball. That's a totally different concept. But just like start 10 Triflex FFPC where you got to cut down. Like what, what is going to change though with the strategy other than, yep, I took a bunch of shots and then someone offered you a third for Mac Michael Wilson during last season and you didn't take the trade. And now you're like, I cut him. So what was the point? Like, what do you change? The, the easiest, the easiest way to explain it to people is I want to set up my rookie draft. So there's no fucking way I leave without Dylan Laub. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So if it's between wide receiver X, right? You, you mentioned Keon Coleman. If it's between Keon Coleman and Dylan Laub in the second round, and I don't think I can get him in the third round, I'm just going to draft him, or I might try to move down a few picks and and position myself to maximize value and get Dylan Laub, and I'm not going after that. That I'm not chasing that siren song wide receiver at the end of the second round. I'm not doing it. So that would be what we're talking about, the principles we're talking about, and how that would influence a particular pick in a particular situation. And When you argue some of the value you get there by drafting Dylan Lobb or even taking a shot on a Spencer Rattler or something like that is you get a quick outcome. Yeah. You will know. You will know, know halfway through the season if those guys are even seeing the field or they have any 
equity for you to use. And the good news is if you hit on Dylan Lobb and he earns like a Keaton Mitchell type role, he's probably more usable than the wide receiver eight on your bench in a league where you can only start up to four. I think that's the key is that even if I whiff on the pick, the odds I whiff on the pick is probably 90% to begin with. It's a third rounder in a 20 man roster league. But when you want to at least pick it at a position where a there's high usability, yeah. If they're a good outcome, and B, I feel I feel nothing cutting Dylan Lobb if he's the next year's Dwayne McBride, just doesn't even get on the field. You know, yeah, I don't care. Right he's off gone my back, man. It, the water's yep. beating up right off. It, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. But if I can get just twelve fantasy points a game from a running back, oh boy. Oh boy, that's valuable. Oh boy. And that's without like the Danny Woodhead giving me that RB6 outcome a year later. Right? That would yeah. be then then now we're really talking. But that's what you get from a receiver that's actually a running back because now he he's he's in play for an 80 catch season at some point from position that's been devalued by the NFL and it's become a lot harder to find, you know, sustainable production at that position whereas it's like a it's a it's a it's a forever sea of sustainable receivers right yeah it's crazy I i think part of part of it too is you do have to look at your individual leagues and what were the pain points last year not only for you or for the league you know what could you draft that then has some sort of liquidity you know, that third rounder where we're, where we're like, okay, what dart are we going to throw? What position are we going to throw this dart at? Like, what, what do you need? Or what did people need last year? Again, like, you know, who do, who do people like, but personally, I am not going to be touching receivers, like rando receivers. I think I'm going to be on the kick this year as of now, backup quarterbacks or just drafting, you know, up to the Spencer Rattlers of the world and then running backs. I think that's going to be my my play. I want the, the best wide receivers or I'm not going to screw around. I mean, let's be honest. I've got 25 leagues, right? I'm going to have a little bit of everybody, a little bit of everybody, but that's a general thought. What's old has become new again. What you just, what you just mentioned was a very old strategy. It's <laughs> a very old, old strategy you're talking about. So we actually haven't started the real show yet. So this was actually pre-show. This was the longest pre-show ever just because you guys are you guys are so you guys are so online with the Dynasty <laughs> Trades in Five show and you're streaming all the time with Destination Devi and and it's just like you know the talking points you pull on that thread and next thing you know 25 minutes boom gone. Love it. So let's uh we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to kick the uh we're going to kick the the show off in a in a real way um with a little little uh little, little formal introduction uh now that we're now that we're 25 minutes in i was i was conscious of not not you know making sure that we didn't steal takes from later in the show so we have a show sheet and the listeners might might be pleased to know we haven't even touched the show sheet yet this is pre-show sheet show that's a and do you guys hear that? Those are those little those little thing you see you hear that right? Oh! Welcome to the Mind of Mansion program. The men from Dynasty Trades in Five, a show that is very short until it's long. These guys are destroying it on YouTube, so subscribe to their channel as soon as possible. This is the future of Dynasty. Here with me today, Clay Moses and Scott Connor. Talk to me. <laughs> Matt, I'm very disappointed that I am in the middle of this show and I did not get the Luke Longley, the man in the middle introduction, <laughs> if everyone remembers that back from the old Bulls in the 90s. The man in the man. middle. I'm not quite seven two like Luke Longley or seven yeah. five or whatever the hell he was, but I'm I'm disappointed because you got the voice. Right. You ha- you could replicate yeah. the Bulls intros, I and could've. we have the song, yeah. and I didn't get the man in the middle. I know, and the reason I should have thought of it is because you guys are both very white. 
that would have that would have been the way to that would have been the, that would have been the the, the, the trigger uh, the memory trigger for me. And so, but in post, see for the podcast in post, we can do this. We could do a little editing in post, right? I could say the man in the middle. <laughs> you know, and then we'll cut it and post. The people in the podcast are like, wait a second, no, he did say it. I think they he did. No say idea. It. Yeah, this is what we we could we could uh, you know that's that's the that's the the magic of podcast editing. But right now we're live, we're live, and I have questions for the Dynasty Trades and Five dudes. They're here to talk Dynasty Trades and Dynasty values and everything Dynasty. This is Dynasty season. As soon as it's April. It's time to see. We you know we can mess around talking about you know some some early best ball in March. It's exciting. These first you know best ball slates get get released and oh the Senior Bowl and the Combine all this stuff. Now we need to start to get methodical about winning our startups and our Dynasty rookie drafts. And so, first question: You guys do a Dynasty trade show? called Dynasty Trades in Five, at what point did it become difficult or impossible? Did you realize, okay, did you reckon with the the idea that we're not going to be able to do a show in five minutes? How long did it yeah. take? You know, I, I'd have to see exactly how many episodes it was before we breached it. I still want to say that it was the Michael Carter show where we went over five minutes. And the reason was is because I used to use the native editor in YouTube, the built in editor in there, and it was busted that day. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to drop this eight minute Michael Carter video. And people were just saying they wanted to you know, hear more of Scott and Shane. So it's like, all right, let's, let's start, uh, let's start doing longer form content. Now we mainly do uh, long live streams, but we just brought back the dynasty trades and five minute trade show twice a week, baby. Who's the host of that? Alan says Oh, Alan! Yes. He's everywhere. This guy is dynasty obsessed. I love it. So any, anytime Alan can get airtime, I'm, I'm a fan. And yeah, it, it makes sense that you would you would you would work hard maybe for a couple of weeks to a month trying to keep it under five minutes and then eventually just the damn breaks. It's over. It's never happening. Again. And also, I find it funny and anyone that YouTubes would finds it um, interesting and amusing that you would actually use the YouTube studio editor, <laughs> given how clunky and impossible that That's thing trash. is. <laughs> It is just, and you're like, it wasn't working that day. Has it ever worked? Is what? the better question. <laughs> I mean, so that, it's funny when you go and you look up, you ever looked up the valuation of Google? It's like however many billions it is. Maybe it's over a trillion now. And you're like, a trillion dollars, right? And yet most of their software is not even operable. And yet, a tr so good for them. Great, great, great job. If you could pull that magic trick off, congratulations. Now, what kind of magic trick trades do you think dynasty managers should be trying to execute right now? So what is the 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 proper disposition to have in your league? How how you know furiously should you be trying to to, to pull trades off at this time of year? What do you think is the right decorum? Like, what is your approach to this? Because you guys do a lot of trades, and we know that active dynasty managers are do the best, right? If you look through who the champions, sure. the cha the halls of champions in your dynasty leagues, the vast majority of the people that are winning leagues are are if let's say there's twelve people in a league, they're in the top six in terms of activity, in terms of activity in the chat, activity with transactions. So what is the right level of activity throughout the year in a dynasty league? Because you, you can become overactive and start to overthink, but where, where's that friction point? I think from the end of the season all the way till up to the draft, uh, I think there's two main goals for me is always one trying to just take good bets, take bets when the odds are in my favor. Anybody that bets a lot of times the best odds are when the, the line is immediately set after a team's the previous game. You wait till up until kickoff information has changed or right up until right when the game starts, information has changed. So I think I'm always trying in the off season from the end of the season until the draft is to constantly be looking for bets that I'm willing to forecast uh, are going to eventually hit 
even if they don't, I'm still getting the best odds on the bet that I made. Waiting until the information is in front of you to then act on the market price. Because one phenomenon is the dynasty, the dynasty space is so reactionary now. Things change day to day, week to week. I mean, you look up on, I mean, we all use Keep Trade Cut. Sunday morning to Sunday night, Rasheed Rice is down 20 spots on Keep Trade Cut <laughs> in less than 12 hours. Now, is that real? Who knows? But the point is, it, the masses are saying his value has dropped. So really, his value hasn't dropped. But what's dropped is his demand, his desirability on the market. There might be more people trying to buy at 30% less and more people trying to sell at 10% less. So there's now a demand that didn't exist before. So that's the thing is trying to make these bets before the information happens, buying guys like Marquise Brown, Deontay Johnson, Calvin Ridley, when they're going outside the top 40 receivers, even if you don't like them, the time to buy them is not after the outcome happened. That's when the person is going, all right, I'm trying to sell. The buyer is the sucker in that circumstance. That's the first thing for me. The second thing is liquidation. As soon as the season ends, 90% of players are worthless. Nobody wants them. <laughs> if you're old, nobody wants you. If you're not great, nobody wants you. If you fall in a dead zone range where you're just a guy at your position, nobody wants you. People want the top 25 players and really nothing else. There's niche pockets of time where people want to buy this player or that player, but largely most players have no demand. So anytime you can find a sucker to take, you know, a Gabe Davis for the 303, he's probably a player I don't even care about. But the mm -hmm. biggest value of that deal is he's off my team and he's on yours. And you actually gave me something for him. It's like cleaning out my junk, my junk closet. That's shit that not, it's not worth anything. Somebody came in and paid me $5 and took it out of my basement. There's not a better deal than that. So until we get after the draft, that's all I'm trying to do in Dynasty from January to May. Liquidate and make positive bets. And even if I'm wrong, at least if I'm right, I get better odds or better return on the bets that I made. It's interesting that after the season most players are worthless. Even players that are valuable, that have utility during the season, there's something yep. about during the season, those players have more value in trade. And once you're in the off season, their value craters. So another principle is in the off season, especially is ask for those guys to be added as throw-ins. Even if you're going to accept it, just come back, reject the trade and come back and say, yeah, that, that trade looks good. But I would like you to add add wide receiver X because who knows, maybe he 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 his team doesn't draft a receiver in the draft. There's a narrative. They right. upgrade right. the quarterback, and then now right. that guy you just you just added some value, or you can move him before your rookie draft because you might be your your roster might be full of players that you don't want to cut. You gotta make room for a bunch of your draft picks, so then all of a sudden you're packaging him with someone else to move up. So like those those guys become actually they have their most value and utility in the days leading up to the rookie draft, but from a perception standpoint, because they can't help you next week when you're setting your lineup, they're not viewed as as valuable. They're actually viewed as more valuable during the season when people could actually acquire them and play them in flex. So that's an interesting thing to do would be to you know try to offload those guys as much during the season. And then you can acquire them as long as you're not giving up anything extra. So Scott's as long saying, as hey, they're you're not going not out there and acquiring these guys for, for, for yeah. anything tangible, but know that they have questionable value to, to a lot of the dynasty managers and they may not have the patience to go and flip them like you do. So as long as you have the confidence that you can flip assets, just that confidence in the ability to flip assets uh, goes a long way. And that's the incentive to be active in the chat and to uh, approach people with sort of a multi-tiered trade talks as opposed to just sending out cold offers, right? So, you know, do you have a system in place to identify the teams that you need to start engaging in trade talks with? Like your teams, your dynasty teams that you know need help do you have a way of prioritizing those teams? And these are the teams I'm going to, I'm going to initiate trade talks. And do you have kind of a system of how to find good trade partners in these particular leagues? I mean, I mean, I'll can... just say that. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say this, and I'll, then I'll let Clay go because I'm curious to what Clay is because I I don't really know Clay's process. He probably knows mine because I talk about it a lot more than he does uh, on air. Mm. But the, the average dynasty manager. 
they're very reactionary during the season. Like 80% of dynasty principles get thrown out the window. Just look, look no further than a guy like Kirk cousins. You probably struggled yeah. to sell him for a first rounder for the last seven years. And then there's idiots giving up first rounders for Sam Howell during the season. It's like Kirk Cousins. Ah, man, he's, he's what he is. Now he's only a QB one for like six out of the last seven years. And then <laughs> Sam Howe, I'd give up a late first for Sam Howe. It's like it, the reason that this works and there's an overcorrection in the offseason is because in season, the new age dynasty player, shout out to Sleeper, because that's brought a lot of them on board. They don't have any patience. They don't have dynasty principles during the season. It's give me it now. Give me that guy scored 22 points last week. Give me it. Give me that player. 26 second round pick. Don't give a shit about that. That can go, you know, future yeah. first. Ah, that's two years out. I'll be able to just get it back. Like you, you see a lot of abandonment of dynasty strategy during the season. Like Matt said, when things are happening, then the off season gets here and everyone goes, oh man, that was a mistake. How do I get those picks back? Who wants Tyler Lockett? Who wants to trade yeah. for him today? You know, February 1st, who wants to trade for him? I'll take any second. It's like, ah, I don't know about that. So go ahead. I want to hear your process, Clay. Let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, this time of year, in, in terms of prioritizing where I'm looking to make moves, like what leagues, like let's take the Dynasty Trades in 5 Squirt League, for example. My team is ready to win. I lost the championship last year, but I look at my squad and they're, they're good players, but this isn't the time to sell them, right? So I look at that league. It's like, okay, there's I shouldn't spend that much time there. Scott and I are going back and forth, kind of dicking around with a uh, with a Garrett Wilson running back trade in one of the in one of the leagues. I've got an inbox offer from Scott. I messed around, so this is a fourteen team start eleven super flex bells and whistles or whatever uh, tight end premium. I sent him. So I've, let me let me reverse a little bit. I have Brees Hall, Bijan, Gibbs, and Achan. Okay, so just to mess with them, I was like, I'm going to send him Achan for Garrett Wilson. I'm going to send him my worst, and I know he's going to come back with Bijan. Sure enough, he did. Immediate counter was was Bijan, and then uh, yeah, we, we met in the middle at Gibbs. I thought, but now let's see what this lovely offer is from Scott Connor. Oh, is this completely different? No, no, no. We we got to pull it up. Okay. So he offers me Garrett Wilson in 224 thirds. I give him Gibbs and Justin Fields. You see, with Scott, I know he's just trying to sneak Justin Fields into deals, right? He's one of 19 people who are trying to give like the equivalent of a 307 for Justin Fields right now. Come on. Come on. Right. So I'm in a lot of leagues with Shane and Scott. And yes, I do listen to them a lot, not only because they talk more than I do, but because I re-listen to every single show we do uh, for purposes of finding TikTok timestamps and whatnot. So yeah, man, it's, 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 it's impossible to trade. I'm good at trading with Shane. He comes right to it. He comes right to it with me. There's not a bunch of fluff. There's not any sneaky Scott Connor stuff going on. Um, but then you get trash offers. So long story short, I go to the people who I can get trades done with in leagues where I've got assets that I need to move that I can move yada, yada, yada. Okay. But <laughs> I, I think sometimes uh, if, if you have a lot of teams, you may focus in on the teams that are struggling or need to be rebuilt. And I think you mentioned something earlier, which is, which is worth noting. Don't forget the teams that are in contention, your best teams, they always can use refining as well. So while you're in there, don't forget about those teams. And, 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 and you can be stronger in any given position, you know, and, and don't forget to put guys on the block. Like to me, it seems like this old fashioned idea and only three guys out of 12 are even going to bother using the feature. But Putting guys on the block, that actually has a lot of power because then, you know, most guys are going to get an alert. That there's been new guys. And then that might trigger a an offer. It might. The thing is, how many times have you done this where you put guys on the block and you get an offer that doesn't even involve that guy? But basically, by you putting guys on the block, it let the league know, hey, I'm active and I'm thinking about doing a trade. And then you, you put yourself and your team top of mind 
So that is an efficient way. As I was looking at, you know, what's the efficient ways that I that I can optimize my teams. I use the on the block feature, and I don't just put guys on the block right after the rookie draft, right, or right before the draft. I pick random times to put guys on the block, and then I'll also make sure I put good players on the block because any player is available. So I'm going to put a couple guys that are, uh, you know, very much uh, on the move, and then I'll maybe put a couple other guys where I'm like, he's great, and I don't want to trade him, but I'm happy to, to field offers. And then we start constructing a trade. You know, you start to get offers that way. So I like that. I think that that's, that's a nice way to, to kick off trade talks is when someone puts players in the block, no matter who the player is, even if it's a player that's not involved or not listed on the, the trade block submission, that's the offer set, the owner, the manager saying, hey, I'm open for business now. Let's do something. Let's do some business. Um, and then also, if you have a text string, you know, just letting people know, hey, guys, uh, I'm interested in doing a trade before the draft. Just letting people know that you're a, a, a good candidate and then let them anything I can do to tell the uh, community, the chat, whatever it is that I'm ready to trade because I'd rather not send the first cold offer. The best trades, when I look back at the trades I've done, when I started with the first cold offer, those trades are typically worse than when I received the initial cold <laughs> offer and then I was able to counter. So I'd love, I love, I much prefer to be in a situation to counter. So strategically, find ways that you can cleverly solicit offers that then kick off trade talks that would that would be my piece of advice what do you guys think of that yeah i mean i love that yeah. because i i i am very much a i play in tons of leagues i don't have time to go through each league and scout each manager and look at all the transactions which means i don't give a shit about players that's the I thing i play entirely based on process roster construction i look at my team is it constructed the way that i want down to the t and then i also know that I'm a winner over a long period of time if I can fish out everyone else in my league to tell me what they're trying to do and how they value stuff. Because I don't care about the players. I'm looking at tiers of receivers. Hey, I need seven receivers in this range. I don't care who they are, but I want you to expose to me what your values are. And if I'm getting a good value and it fits my construction, I'll take the deal. So that it being able to get... I think Matt makes an awesome point of being able to get other people to expose what their values are and tents are to me. I'm not, I don't necessarily care about, I have to nickel and dime and win every deal. If it accomplishes what I'm trying to accomplish, I'll accept it. But I usually have to send out the initial offer 95% of the time just to get it going. But the beauty is when they counter, it's annoying when people don't counter or they, they won't really give you a, uh, I have an example that I'll share. I'm in a league with one player, one person that's in like five leagues with me. All right, so I send out an offer to them for Justin Fields. I send them like a 207 and 210 for Justin Fields. That's probably a fair market price, right? Two seconds. He's a backup <laughs> QB. And the Steelers have no incentive to play him more than half. The Steelers have no incentive to play him more than half the games. But the point is that's a starting offer. The, the proper rejection from that player is I don't really want to sell Fields at this time. And that's too low of a price. I'll wait till he gets a starting job and I'll sell him. So then I go to another league with this same manager. I send them Justin Fields. I'm giving them Fields here for their 26 first. I, I can't pay a first for him, man. He's not a starter. Legit. So I boxed that person in and the end result was they just, they're just scared to make a trade on either way, either side. They, they're, they're so not convicted at all. They, they didn't counter either offer. And I'm literally sending them and buying the same player from them, trying to box them in on their values, and they just walked away from both deals. So what was their intent? <laughs> well, what let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What was your intent, Ben? You said you offered like the 207 and what, 210 or something for Justin Fields? My intent right? is to no, get no, them no. To, commit so... to commit to what the price is. And I'll decide, because I want to buy Justin Fields. Everyone's heard me say that. Commit to what the price is. It's not the 207 and the 210. What is it? Is it the 203? 
Wh- what I was what I was getting at is why did you offer me <laughs> two thirds, two thirds and okay, yeah, back to that trade, two thirds and Garrett Wilson, Matt or Jameer Gibbs and what is it? Jameer Gibbs and freaking sorry, this is bad. Uh, I'll, bad I'll just cut to play. I'll cut oh, and just in Justin Fields. Basically, you were valuing Justin Fields as like nothing or you I, value I will, Garrett Wilson way ahead of Jameer Gibbs. I'll no, I know what chain. he's doing. He's trying to take advantage of this bias toward wide receivers. There's a it, wide it, receiver play. bias he's trying to take advantage of. That's what he's doing. Elite wide receivers are viewed in a different tier now than the elite running backs. That's a thing that's been happening in the last five years. Well, and here's the problem Clay has. This is a listener league of trades in five who doesn't like running backs. Clay's receivers suck. He has Bijan, Gibbs, A-Chain, and Brees Hall. And, He's desperate. And Jameer Gibbs. He's de- you, have, you have the top I'm, I'm four the running backs. I'm the champ. I'm the desperate I, I, all I'm saying <laughs> is I, I also know that in that league, all the receivers above Garrett Wilson are not available. I have like the Clay made a great job of uh, the Clay could have had receivers and in, 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 over the years. That league. And, and he smashed I, that I, league drafting running backs. My uh, receivers exactly. aren't and bad. I'm, I mean, Nico. I'm also Rishi not Rice, going to give Cal- up. I'm Garrett Wilson for Clay's fourth <laughs> running back. That that's extrinsic value that I'm handing Clay, so we may not get a sure. deal done. That's all. You're you're helping fix my roster construction. I knew it, and I I was the one who originally made the offer to Scott. So it's so clear he has the leverage right off the bat because I was the one proactively making the offer, and I have the top <laughs> the top running backs, all five of them, or five of the top six, however you look at it. Clay, embarrassment of riches. Here is my advice: if I was if we were co managers here. I would say we should find a because I, I like giving people particular tactics that they can use on a day to day basis to manage their league, manage their team. Tangible rules of thumb. So in this case, I would say set the bar, set a, a, a watermark at Jaden Reed. And we're not Jaden Reed, Michael Pittman. We're not taking trades for receivers we're not interested in receivers above that watermark because then we're starting to get in an overpay world like garrett wilson our whole what what was your goal of building this team your goal was to have the point epicenter be the running back position at a time when the running back position is a value right It, it is be able to be acquired at a discount so it's very smart it was a very smart approach to team building that you had. Why would you suddenly hit the cancel button on your entire strategy? You're not going to do that, right? No. So instead, you're going to go out and you're going to look for deals on a Pittman, deals on, especially if the Colts draft another wide receiver, right? So he, where where are the values at wide receiver? And you know, I'm going to look for wide receivers that anywhere below this could be old because my, I'm in win now mode. So I could be going after a 30 year old receiver who was elite. You talked about Devontae Adams earlier. I might be targeting a Devontae Adams. I might be targeting a young receiver with upside. Yeah, I might be targeting some sort of tarnished assets, even a Rashi Rice. You know, like just, be, just because I have that luxury, my roster is constructed in a way that I could take a chance on a Rashi Rice right now. You know, that's the move. The last thing you would do is forget how you got there with your team building and go and overpay for Garrett Wilson. Yeah, and and part of it too with with this league in particular, we draft before the NFL draft. Our rookie drafts are beforehand. And year one of the league, I had 101, 102, and I took Brees, which is cool. But then I took Malik Willis. So that was a big flop. But then I I got a bunch of picks together and I just hit on freaking all of them. I, I just I, I hit on a lot of them. Let's say Achan Laporta, yeah, yeah, just just hit. So I mean, I'll, I'll take some credit. But now I look at my team and it's like, 
Maybe I'll just keep smashing people in the face with these running backs. <laughs> like I, I've got, you know, I've got the one on one this year and then 225 first. So maybe I'll just smash people in the face this year. I believe there's a chapter in this book, the Dynasty Dominator, which which is uh, titled Smash People in the Face with Running Backs. I believe the <laughs> Dynasty Dominator book available on Amazon does have that exact chapter in it. Awesome. And I love the idea of acquiring fields because, you know, I'm old enough to remember a quarterback named Ryan Tannehill. And uh, so for the kids out there, there was a there was a quarterback named Ryan Tannehill and he's still in the league and he was drafted originally by the Dolphins. And the reason he was drafted by the Dolphins, like ninth overall from Texas A&M, because of his mobility, mobility. He was an athlete. He was a raw athlete and he was viewed as sort of a discount version of the the new all purpose weapon quarterback. And during his time in Miami, he flailed and was considered a bust. And then he was you know, moved to Tennessee. And in Tennessee, he became a valuable super flex asset. I think we would all agree that there was a time when you could acquire a first round pick in super flex for Ryan Tannehill. Is that true? Yes, it is. Yes, it yep. is true. And you can go down the board. It took a while for Kirk Cousins, but now you definitely can, right? And then we go down the board. All these is Jared Goff on the team that drafted him? <laughs> no, no, right? No, but it, isn't he one of the most prolific passers in the league? Yeah. So there's lots of examples of quarterbacks where it just didn't work out in their original landing spot for whatever reason. Most of them struggled more than Justin Fields struggled, by the way. It just so happened that the, the Bears had this master stroke of a trade with the Panthers that put him in this position to get Caleb Williams. That's the number one reason why Justin Fields is on the Steelers now. So of all the quarterbacks that are changing teams and they're giving up on Fields, and you know the NFL showed you know based on the the the, the, the trade value that he commanded that that he's just not valuable. Or there's a bunch of general managers that are satisfied with their quarterbacks, have invested a lot in their quarterbacks. Even if you have Baker Mayfield, you've invested in getting Baker Mayfield integrated into your system, and now Baker Mayfield's shown some leadership with your roster to just, again, hit the cancel button on Baker Mayfield has a cost to it, right? So there's a, there's a reason why it's not a totally efficient market, especially for quarterback Right. It's a, it's an interesting market where there's going to be huge inflation and overpay on one end of the quarterback spectrum. And then there's some real some incredible discounts you can get, like the discount that's been available in, in the free agent market on Jacoby Brissett for so many years. Right. Jacoby Brissett signs a one year deal for five million dollars. And I'm like, how is this possible? This is crazy. He's way more valuable to that than that to an NFL team. But that's what it is. And so you Leading off with my number one player to acquire right now, especially in Superflex, is Justin Fields, is is uh, just a masterstroke. Well, I mean, I'll give a shout out to you guys because uh, Decision Point's coming back, which was my favorite show on Player Profiler because you talk through some of this stuff. And I think one of the things with Fields is that no team was going to trade more than a sixth rounder because they knew they weren't picking up his fifth year option, which is a significant commitment next year. Uh, and I think that's probably good for Fields as well. He's got an open audition. He's not tied to Pittsburgh. In right. fact, I think Pittsburgh basically looked at it like we're going to go one year trying to rebuild our QB room. They got two super efficient cost perspective QBs, but I don't think they're tied to either one. I think it's BS, this talk about they're going to extend Russell Wilson. And I also think the odd Justin Fields is in Pittsburgh after this year is less than 5%. He has no incentive to stay in Pittsburgh because they're probably not going to give him enough of a shot for him to say, for sure, I'm staying there. Right. And I do agree with you, Matt. I, I think the market was very much a supply and demand. Uh, and you have to admit, with Fields' style, he's not going to be for everything. He's po he's polarizing. It's like having a pool at your house. you know. And that's not, not – that doesn't mean he's bad. It just means there's probably half the jobs in the league he's locked out before we're not giving you a hundred thousand dollars for him let alone a draft pick you know what i mean because he just doesn't fit right so that's, i don't think it's an indictment on him 
Um, I do think the reason I want to buy him is partially because I, I've been working on uh, rookie draft pick war, and essentially, what is the value of a weekly spike week or a weekly, you know, top twelve QB week or whatnot in terms of draft picks? And if you can buy Justin Fields for less than a first, you can probably get away with when he starts. You guys would agree that the minute he starts, whether it's six games next year, the weekly rankings, he would be a top 12 QB or better. The weeks he's starting, he, he's automatically sure. he vaults above a lot of the replacement level QBs from a weekly standpoint. Okay, over. Okay, get, do an over-under. Over-under, 0.5, 40-point weeks in 2024 for Justin Fields. Hmm. 40-pointers, huh? I, right. I would I would probably go I, over I just because I would bet on he starting seven to eight games half the season and then maybe he gives you one or two. But the, the point is, you just may watch. be able to He's use one, him. Man. You, you may be able to use him, and then the real beauty of it is even if and I don't I've been a in huge prosecutor of Justin Fields. I don't think he's good. He's not a good passer. The number the data backs it up. He's an awful passer, but. That doesn't matter. I'm trying to buy him more than I've ever wanted to buy him because I can use him, get positive war just by using him, and then the best strategy is I can sell him to somebody else and probably get more than I paid back, and I'm still out of the Justin Fields business like I was before he got traded yeah. to the Steelers. So I'm I'm in a I'm in a pickle. All right. So when Justin Fields went to the Steelers, I my organic response was thank you like great for my justin field shares right i knew there was going to be an onslaught of bad offers i was close in that same league but i i couldn't i couldn't get there it's a 14 team super flex again i was offered the 203 in jared stidham okay mm. so that is what a 14 teamer but i couldn't pull the trigger i couldn't pull the trigger I was like, you know what? In a 14 team super flex, I think my quarterbacks are, what is it? T law, Jordan love, and I've got the one Uh, so we'll see what I do there. But what do you think? I mean, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Two Oh three and Jared sit them. That's the 17th pick overall in a rookie draft. Yep. Yep. Well, I'm, I'm curious. Cause it seems like all three of us are pro fields in terms of trying to buy him right now. But I mean, I'll, I'll throw this to the chat. What is the sell price? Today, what is your sell price? Because it's not realistic to say I need a first because you're probably not getting it. But what what is the price you would let them go? Maybe not a 14-teamer because there's a scarcity component that comes into play there. But just your typical 12-team, start 10, start 11, pretty straightforward. Let's call it five point per passing touchdown like we like to do on trades in five. It gives you a little blend of the six versus the four point. What's the sell price? What is the walkaway price? You've been holding fields. You're waiting for that opportunity that you would sell for today and just wipe your hands clean. So is, is he your, he's your QB three slash four. Who's your other bench quarterback? It doesn't matter. What is the walkaway price? Cause I, I guess for me, I'm not rostering him with the intent of using him until he's in, in there. So I'm not even looking at what my other QBs around him look like. I'm looking at what what is the price I would walk away from that speculative buy now. Is it a first? For well, late first, yeah, late first. Uh, I would I would rather have Justin Fields in a late first. Okay. And you know I just so one I, one eleven. I, 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 I want to ensure you you're not taking it. One eleven. You're not taking that for Fields. No. No. Okay. No, I, I I like Lad McConkey, right? I like Trey Benson. I I, I like these play. I like Jonathan Brooks. But forty points, <laughs> right? I mean, look at these comments in the chat. Two seconds and a third. Two seconds. I'd take the two oh four for Fields. I mean it. It's interesting because I I'm asking you guys this because I've asked people in my leagues that decline my Fields trades. What's the price? And not a single person has come right out and said, this is it. It's like they're, they're, they're scared to move them. And to me, I'm, that's a foreign concept to me where you can't give a price on something, even if it's too high. Well, they're, they're being smart. They're not telling you what the price is. Make a better offer is, is the price. Are you so confident in Xavier Worthy that you're, you, you'd rather have him? That, I know. I like Xavier Worthy a lot. I think Xavier Worthy is a special talent. 
He's super exciting. He's better than John Ross, better than all these small speedsters, these small blazers that had gone in the first round previously. He's better than Henry Ruggs. But I don't know how much better. And those guys are going to give you a handful of spike weeks. And I'm just not... I just... The spike weeks from the quarterback position in Superflex and the fact that we don't know what Justin Fields is. Justin Fields has been inaccurate for two seasons. One of those seasons, he had no receivers whatsoever. Uh, And we've seen for years that quarterbacks can be super inefficient and and be revolutionized by getting an upgraded offensive line, by getting a better receiver core, by getting a new coach, by getting traded. Uh, So all he needs is a nominal increase in passing efficiency and he's a, a, a you know a bottom half of the league starter who a team would commit to for one or two years and see what happens he could even perform well enough early enough this year for Pittsburgh because they've already reserved you know salary cap space, a fifth year option potentially for Pickett. They obviously wanted Pickett to hit so they could use the Pickett's fifth year option. So you know, in terms of salary cap planning, another reason why Fields didn't land anywhere else is because you have to get we talked about it, the general manager and the coach and maybe the equity holders to all okay, we're gonna make this trade. Okay, this is a this is one where you would call up, you know, the equity holders and be like, are are we are you okay with us making this trade? So you have to get everybody in agreement that we're going to make this deal. And then you have to, uh, you know, and, and it cr- causes all this uncertainty with the roster. And then you also, everything you've invested in the current quarterback is then nullified. So now all of a sudden you get to a position where the only team that's even calling Chicago back is Pittsburgh. Right? So that's where you end up negotiating against yourself. And then the, the, the valuation looks pathetic um, and, and embarrassing. And then that's what, so many in dynasty will, will fixate on uh, where I'm just like, Hey, last time I checked, this guy had, I mean, what is the precedent for a guy putting up multiple 40 point weeks in consecutive seasons? And then the NFL just pulling the rug out from under him and walking completely away. I mean, when does that even happen? Well, and, I guess I guess in and of itself, though, it's an outlier that a quarterback is putting up those kinds of numbers, right? So you're I mean, you're taking something that's already niche and making it more niche, right? I mean, even the Patriots of all teams decided to give Cam Newton another shot, right? And so, I mean, I just I think we're talking about an we're talking about a player though that we've never seen this type of player in dynasty. It's an outlier. It's a one of one. We're probably not going to see it again. And this year is big. They have to pick up his fifth year option by May. There is no let's see how he plays. It's now. And if I'm Justin Fields, I'm going to use the Steelers as a chance for me to kind of recoup some of my market. And if I hit free agency, they bailed me out because now I'm not on a fifth year option salary. I'm hitting free agency. It's an open market. Now, does he maybe like Pittsburgh and want to go back? If they promise him, maybe we'll give him a two year commitment or, you know, a, a two year deal with an out after a year if he doesn't perform. Like I can see that being the outcome. But I, I guess my my thing is if you're buying Justin Fields. I get it, the fantasy points, the 40-point games, the, the top five, top 12 weeks, those are those matter. But in terms of him being a premium asset, it's it's this stretch of time between now and next summer. If he fails again and he hits the market and it's, oh, man, I don't know about him. I don't know if he's going to get, you know, he's he's just a bridge quarterback at that point. So the price now to speculate on him is double what it's going to be next year. So it feels like this is the time to get in get some shares, be willing to sell when he, when he, you know, sell some of them at the right price, but also take advantage of some of his production. So it's, it, it's a, it's an, it's a market I've never seen in dynasty. We may never see a player like this again. It's, it's, it's interesting with him because, you know, the Steelers, they invest in the offensive line, they invest in the wide receiver position in recent years. So you got to think the protection is going to be better this year. And, of all the perimeter receivers that would help a quarterback that struggles with accuracy, wouldn't George Pickens be one of the one of the guys that you would nominate? 
Yeah, I mean, it, he's Justin Fields is a live asset, which is which is why you want to have him. Yes, the crooked fantasy numbers, but also there would be a market. But I just wonder, like, if you're acquiring him, are you acquiring him for those hopeful forty point weeks, or do you think you're actually going to be able to get a first? Like, let's say he comes in week four, uh, puts up a good game, puts up another good game. Are you going to sell him for a twenty five first? Are you gonna are you gonna get one? Right? Like what's the play? What what's the cost to get out? Or are you mainly purchasing them? Assuming it makes <clears throat> excuse me, assume, assuming it makes sense for your roster construction. What's what's the play? Well, we're all grown ups here and we're we all have brains. And if what we see is revolutionary in terms of you know, his accuracy and, and his play, you know, I I'm human. And, you know, I have a Bayesian process and I may be going into it expecting to flip him for a first rounder if he performs and I may, I may pull back. I may see, so you know what? I'm sold. I'm keeping him. It's not, it's, 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 he's a one of one, just like I said, it's unprecedented. We've seen a guy like this. So I'm open to anything. Like I can't answer that question, right? I would say. 75% 75% chance I'm flipping him at that point. But so you think you'll be able to get a first for him in most circumstances? Dude, you, you, can, you can't get him for less than a first today. No, I know, but is he going to be one of those players like the Keenan Allens and all where you want a second, people don't want to give a second, and it's just a stalemate? Well, that, it's, I, it's over at that point. You're not, you're not happy. It's not a hit at that point. For, what, for what, me, what, what we're talking about is potentially getting a first round plus. The, yeah, it, you you got to remember, man. Clay, come on. You you talking about multiple games? I think Scott and I are, are saying it's one game. He gives us he gives you one forty point game. He he looks back. He puts up an efficient game, right? He goes you know twenty eight of thirty five, eighty yards rushing, forty fantasy points, right? Uh, you know he there's all this narrative. The narrative with him, best friends with George Pickens, they're hugging each other. They got their arms around each other in the locker room. Shower narrative. Well, not not in the shower. They'll be their, their hand. They'll be around. They'll be hugging with the clothes on, but <laughs> no, they'll be gosh. it'll be outside the it'll be outside the it, shower, Clay. But but uh, like in, yeah, in any we're, case, we're saying, in any case, there's gonna this. be you know there's gonna be this whole the Tomlin. Think that, about that. the Tomlin coach speak. Think about it. We're talking about one game. We're talking about one game, and you, it, it, you let your imagination run wild. This is why, if I have Justin Fields and I see an offer come in with a one eleven, I'm I can't do it, dude. I can't do it. Hmm. The guy I want in the offense, like, moving on from Fields, because we could literally talk about Fields for an hour of this show. Yeah. Get, give me some Pat Fryermuth. That's probably the guy I'd rather buy over George Pickens. I mean, Pickens is good. We like Pickens. Uh, anybody that's seen our stuff at Destination Devi, the Trinity Tracker, Trinity Tracker loves George Pickens. Um, I've been a proponent of Pickens for not not a whole season, but I came around after seeing the Trinity data at the end of last year, and now he's kind of reached that point where he's he's bunched in with a lot of other receivers. But give me Fryermuth instead. He feels like a tight end. His first two years pretty productive for a first and second year tight end. And then you look at his situation and you go, man, is this guy really tight end 19? Is Jake Ferguson really that much better than Pat Fryermuth? If I can get Jake Ferguson plus. Jake Ferguson's scary, not better than Pat Fryermuth. Pat Fryermuth is definitively one, better than Jake Ferguson. Put Pat Fryermuth on the on the Cowboys and see what happens. Another scary one people aren't talking about, Cole Komet. Cole Komet's only good because he's played more snaps than any tight end in like the last two years by 400. He's not good. And now he's got Shane Waldron, who apparently loves every tight end that you can put on the field at one time. So I think there's some pivots to Pat Fryermuth, and he may end up be one of the ones where you look up and go, wow, that guy had 110 targets. And he was a tight end 19 prices or whatnot. So he's the guy I want. Pickens is tough to buy. Because like you said, Matt, everything's already set. The narrative has already been set with Pickens. It is. You know you're paying the 108, 109 to get him, and there's not going to be a penny less. So the time has passed. That's not a player I'd want to buy at this point. There's a great question in the chat because we do need to – We I want to cover the, the, the full spectrum of, of dynasty strategy here. How much trading do you guys do 
in startups? A lot. <laughs> yeah, like what? Tee us up or, or get us a little bit tighter. Are you talking about the first round, second round, all throughout? Well, no, there's some people that are very active in startups. They're moving around constantly. And there's others that pretty much just stay pat and they draft where they draft. And there's some in between where there are some people that are just taking like opportunistic trades when they come around, but they're really not very active in trade talks during a startup. Where do you guys fall? I think if you're going to do a snake draft startup, I prefer to do auction startups versus snake drafts because I can control my roster construction a lot better. Uh, but to do a snake startup where, you know, you pick your draft slot, even if it's not a third round reversal, to really do it right, you got to be hyperactive. You got to know exactly the, ra the ranges to trade out of. You got to know what your plan is. Uh, but I think there's a lot of dead zone pockets in the current Superflex ADP where you can look at the third round versus the sixth round and you're like, there's not a big difference. And then there's other spots where I want to have clusters of picks because let's say I'm going hero RB or zero RB. I probably want to have picks between rounds 10 and 15, an excess of them, because I know right there, I'm basically just going to piss away the picks and draft a bunch of running backs. They're one year bets. They're filling my roster construction, but I want to try to probably cluster picks there, which is going to require some trading out of, those sexy rounds that people just have to get that receiver that they want, or they have to get that QB 19 that they think is a tear break between that and the QB 24, which you're going to get for two rounds later. So like you really have to grind. So if you're going to do it right, you got to be sitting on the clock. As soon as you get your draft spot, if you draw the 104, you got to be spamming out the deal where you try to trade down to the 106 trade down to the, you know, whatever your plan is, you got to be the aggressor and someone's not going to hand you, the deal that fits exactly what you're trying to do. And you probably got to map it out by looking at some ADP and saying, do I really want to pick in this range? Do I want to pick the wide receiver 20 at the 408 where someone else gets the wide receiver 35 at the 705? And I'm looking at the players and I'm going, they're not that different. One's two years younger than the other, but their production over a two to three year window is exactly the same. So why am I paying the premium rather than trading out? And I think the startup's the best time you can leverage other people. I mean, Matt, I'm sure you've seen it. People trade back in the, the fourth and they get a seventh rounder and someone gives them a future first. <sighs> Just so one yeah. person can yep. pick a player. And then you look at the deal and you go, yeah, wait a second, well, Clay. That's... So you gave up a first and drafted Devon A-Chain. And then I drafted Josh Jacobs and got a first. Mm -hmm. And I'm going like, I, there's a chance I get the better running back for a year or two. And you gave me a first deleveraged your future. And I did that four times and I have a somewhat competitive team and I own next year's draft like that. The only time you can take advantage of people's hopium on what they can be immediately this year is in the startup. So you got to grind. If you just sit and make your pick, you're destined for fifth to eighth place. Unfortunately. Yeah. A couple principles is a absolutely try to do whatever you can to come away with multiple firsts. So yours and at least one other person's first the following year, that's a goal. Find the uh, sort of uh, the, the, the plateaus, right? The, the, the smooth breaks. spots in the ADP. And we have the lifetime value on the player profile or dynasty rankings. We have, you know, lifetime values and you can see these swaths that you're talking about where there's 20 guys, you know, in the 60 to 75 range and know that, like, so a, a draft pick in this round is pretty worthless. You can just trade back around. So once you get into that place, just start aggressively trying to acquire future seconds and thirds, not because you necessarily want to use those picks, but because you just want those assets for future trades. And so you, if I can leave a draft, if let's mm -hmm. say there's a five-round rookie draft, if I can leave the draft with 10 2025 picks – right? That I'm feeling really good. Uh, and the sacrifice you have to make can be shockingly low, especially if you decide, Hey, I'm going to actually, I'm going to do, I'm going to load up on 2025 picks and do win now with the Josh Jacobs types where it's conceivable that Josh Jacobs has more fantasy points from this point forward than Devon A-Chain, because I'm not sure that Devon A-Chain 
can ever be a primary back in the league. And Josh Jacobs, we could look up in three years, and he's still going strong. He's not that old. He came into the league at age 21. So it's it's it, 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 it kind of breaks your brain to think that. But when you start to imagine, okay, yeah, th- this veteran's actually not that old. And I could be looking at, you know, a, a, an absolute windfall win just by get, but you always in those situations have to be okay giving up a guy with a lot of sex appeal, right? When you give up an A chain, you got to be able yep. to give up big time sex appeal. We talked about Jameer Gibbs earlier. I mean, that would probably be uh, the, the 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 sexiest of the sex appeal guys, the Garrett Wilsons. I mean, you got to really give it up, but to but in, and to move down a couple rounds, secure a first rounder, you're going to be happy in the long run because the difference between Garrett Wilson and the guy you drafted in the fourth round, actually in terms of fantasy points per game, might be negligible. That's the crazy part. That's the crazy part. Uh, and, and again, take advantage of the fact, the flattening of the wide receiver position. There's so many ways you can take advantage of that by trading down in startups. And the other thing I'll say is, this notion that you should try to, you know, set up a WhatsApp group. If you have a bunch of international players, make sure you're setting up a WhatsApp group. Create ways to uh, create en- engagement with your with your league mates where you can uh, put out signals that you're ready to trade without actually sending the first offer. Anything, anything it takes. The chat, text message, email, all of the above. Get the, get the word out that you're ready to trade and start receiving offers. That's pre. That's that's post startup, right? In the startup, you do what Scott says, which is you take the spam gloves off, right? In a startup, you're spamming offers. If there's a time to spam offers, it's a startup. Yeah, yeah. I think it's nice too to. Uh to cluster picks when you're doing like you're talking about Matt and you're picking up 25 thirds or or what have you picking up thirds. It's nice to get them clustered in that, you know, pick, pick your round, but eight, nine, 10, because then you have some leverage on the clock too. Like, let's say if somebody still is in play, pick a player mode and want to come up and, you know, break up your next four of six picks, you manage to cluster together. Then you've got more leverage to get more of those thirds, kick it back. Like you're saying. Yeah. And there's no better feeling in a startup when you leave with a, I don't have, here's the thing. If I'm doing a snake startup and I executed it with, you know, what, how I would want to do it, which means I'm probably gonna have to carve out two or three days during that first eight rounds of the draft to make sure I'm on my phone, to make sure I'm sending out the offers that look like what I want. You know, I'm giving up my first and getting back a second and a third, and maybe I'll give back a, a 10th or something like that. Or, you know, I'll do, the, the, the leverage deal where I give up a, a third and get back a seventh and a future first. And I'll just gamble that I'm going to get a player that's close to what you're taking at the third, but you get the sex appeal, like Matt said. But there's I don't need to leave the startup with the best team. Give me a team that's in the top six that has some live assets, but I also have a bunch of future picks, a couple thirds, a couple seconds, an extra first or two, because uh, there's nothing better than having a team that's in the final four playing for a championship. But then you look and you go, yeah, but I also have three firsts yeah, next year. We've got a couple so if I don't win, to going. I don't win. The clock strikes midnight. We start a brand new season on January 6th or whatever the hell the last game is. And I go, okay, I'm ready for next year. Whereas these other teams that traded their first, I mean, they're, you guys can attest, there's no worse feeling than when you trade your future first. And then some other asshole sitting on the 102 because yours went south. And now you're going, man, like Shane will always say, go back to them and see if you can get your pick back. At that point, it's too late. You know, yeah, I, right. I just hate deleveraging myself early in a league because if you're wrong, those are the toughest teams to try to build, or to pull out of the hole. They really are. It takes work. I have 10 burning questions for you guys. 10 burning questions. We're getting to some rookie talk. 10 burning questions after this. Now, I know many of you are looking for a secret weapon for your Dynasty League, and I have it. It's called the Dynasty Dominator app. You go to the App Store, go to Google Play. It's right there. It's $5 to download, and then every year it's $5 to load the next incoming class of rookies. You can add Superflex, add tight end premium. It's incredible because it allows you to look up players. It allows you to vote on whether a player is a buy, hold, or sell, and then 
see the market sentiment on that player, and you can compare their lifetime value rating from Player Profiler to their Dynasty ADP at the FFPC, all in the price lookup tool. And beyond that, we have a trade analyzer, so you'll never lose another Dynasty trade again. And in our settings, you can set, this is a win now team, this is a rebuilding team, and then we let you compare players. Look at their metrics side by side. Prospect metrics, NFL metrics. It's all there. It's five bucks in the App Store. There's some add-ons for Superflex and to buy the upcoming rookie class. Every year, you're going to spend $5 on this thing. And it's going to be well worth it. Five burning questions. Five. No. Six. No. Seven. No. Eight. No. Nine. Ten. Ten burning questions <laughs> for the Dynasty Trades and Five Guys. All right. How do you approach super flex drafts? You, Clay. Super flex rookie drafts. We're not talking startups anymore. Whatever it <laughs> is. What, what, basically, th this is code for what is the correct valuation of quarterbacks in Dynasty? Two quarterback leagues, super flex leagues. Last year, Scott and I really dug into this topic. And it's worth circling back to this year. Yeah, I think for for me, I'll I'll admit historically in super flex drafts, I if there's any question, I lean quarterback. Like the tie goes to the quarterback more than the tie goes to the quarterback for me. With that being said, it has gotten tougher. It depends on the league, obviously, tons of different things, but it's tougher to sell quarterbacks after the fact. So you find yourself with an, with an extra asset that's worth a first that you're kind of just holding on to, maybe because of the scarcity aspect or what. So I'm really going to be looking at roster construction in terms of at 102, do I want to take Jaden Daniels or, or Drake May, or should I take, you know, Marvin Harrison? If he's there, or am I kicking out of quarterbacks until JD and Carthyville, that kind of thing. So I tend to be very QB heavy in my, in my rookie drafts. Yeah. I think one thing we talked about before the show actually went to the show sheet, but we talked a little bit about the wide receiver saturation. Um, I, I lean on in lineup leagues, especially best ball. It's different best ball. You really can't afford to have backup QBs, but in lineup leagues, I'm okay with missing on a quarterback. I know it's expensive, but I'm okay missing on a quarterback, not becoming a difference maker. Uh, as long as they're an asset that will hold value and has some equity on my roster construction, worst case scenario. So this year, I think I'm going to be more interested in taking Michael Penix, Bo Nix, Spencer Rattler over some of the receivers, even if they land in spots where you go after a year, they're backups. Cause the way I'm going to roster construct, I'm still interested in rosters back rostering as many backup QBs as I can for that reason. And it leans into the only alternative is usually running backs. And those are going to appear, appear very obvious once, once we see their landing spots and then receivers. So I think with this year, I wouldn't say I would at the high end, if I'm drafting 103, 104, 105, I'm actually fine kind of fading the QBs, but I'm going to be more interested in the second tier of QBs. So Knicks, Rattler, Penix, I'm going to be very interested in taking those guys over some others because I do think there's some floor value with my roster construction versus taking the wide receiver 10 or the running back 4 or whatever might be there. My issue is in rookie drafts that currently, this is changing, but J.J. McCarthy, QB4 now. But to me, he's closer to the QB2. And, you know, J.J. McCarthy goes top 10 and ends up in a better landing spot than, let's say, Drake May, at the very least. Uh, Jaden Daniels probably as well. I'm, uh, it'd be difficult for me to draft any wide receiver over J.J. McCarthy, given what I know about a hit at quarterback and how much it means. I mean, we've all been through this. We've my, 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 It's just from experience... You can tell the people that are the most YOLO about quarterback and willing to pass on quarterback time and time again. And you're like, this is, uh, I think this is officially a mistake, bro. I mean, you're, you're going to go to the trade market and try to get a quarterback at this point. Um, we'll see how it goes. Good luck with that. Right. When you're in a startup, you, you, you know what I'm talking about where I'm like, I've been in that situation and it's been so painful and it's 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 been such an abyss and it's so hard like there's actually 
there creates an overhang of effort that is involved. And I know I'm going to, I'm setting myself up to work twice as hard in this league as my other leagues. And it basically, it drains my ability to focus on these other leagues because I'm trying to fix the quarterback position in this one super flex league where I decided to pass on it again, just because I'm enamored with, you know, Roma Dunze, right? Or, or as I like to call him, Romeo Dunze. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's my and it, so th- this this appreciation for future pain that I know it, it, I'm going to be caused, and the the nice relaxing relief of the hot tub of having a great quarterback room and super flex. It's why I always lean on you know lean on McCarthy over a wide receiver in that situation. I mean, if it's Marvin Harrison, and I know that it, you're not going to make a, you're not going to blatantly, uh, you know, uh, take a, a a negative expected value trade, uh, you know, or or make a draft pick where you know you could have got more if you just flipped the pick and moved down two spots and got the same guy. I'm not saying I. I, I in most situations, though, that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm I'm gonna move of, down. I'm gonna say, hey, you know, I'm in the 102, and I'm gonna move down to the 105, and I'm just gonna go. So it's not like I'm gonna I'm not gonna look. Uh, I'm not gonna ignore ADP and market value. I, this it's gonna be a cue to me to make a move and move down and get a quarterback, and then I just won't end up with these wide receivers. What ends up happening is you look at my rosters. I don't have those guys on my teams. I, I think you got to get a pulse too on your league because. A lot of people will ask us questions on trades in five. Hey, should I draft? What should I do with the 102 pick? Uh, Marvin Harrison is going 101. I already know. The manager has told me. And then they show you their QB room, and it's Anthony Richardson, Patrick Mahomes, and Joe Burrow. And they're scared to death to draft Caleb Williams because they don't need it. But really, the way you should be thinking about that is even if it's not the 102. Even if you're there at the 106 or 107 and you're going, man, do I really want to take Brock Bowers in a non-tight end premium league or do I want to take QB4 or J.J. McCarthy? You should be looking at it as, I draft J.J. McCarthy, but what has it done? It has now allowed me to make a different bet against one of the QBs that I already have. Go trade them. We get so narrow focused on, oh, man, I, I, I already have good QBs. What can I trade J.J. McCarthy for? And you're not confident people are going to trade you anything for them. Slide him into your QB3. Go shop Patrick Mahomes. Guarantee you, you can get an offer for it. It may not be exactly <laughs> what you want, but the point is you you have three QBs that people already want. Thank you. And Thank you for saying that. I had this discussion that. with somebody yesterday. They go, my QB room is Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and Will Levis, right? And they go, nobody wants Will Levis in my league. <laughs> well, the the conversation pivoted to what, what can you get for Josh Allen? And it's like, well, I might be able to get Justin Jefferson in a first. Okay, then maybe you can consider the bet where you get Justin Jefferson in a first and you just bet it, make a bet on Will Levis, especially if you have 30 dynasty leagues. I mean, this person had a lot of dynasty leagues. So I'm like, take the bet on Will Levis. Don't try to force a square peg into a round hole and end up taking the 206 for Will Levis because nobody wants him. That should be the league where you leverage the fact you just bet on him. And I know that's an extreme example because you're trading away Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts, but you get the point. Don't look at rookie picks as they either fit my team or they don't. Look at it as what flexibility does allow me to do if I take J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, and if I, if I want J.J. McCarthy, I could conceivably trade all the way back to the 106. And is it possible he goes to the 104, 105? Yes, it's it's possible. Maybe I trade back to the 108. Is it possible I can get him there? Yes, let your league mates fuck up in front of you. Give them an opportunity to make a mistake. Right? That is critically important. There are going to be rookie drafts in Superflex and 2QB that start Harrison neighbors. You know that's going to happen. Those you're going to yep. it's going to be but you're going to see screenshots of those those aren't going to happen, right? And then so the guy at the 103 is like, "Hey, wow, this is crazy." Right? Yeah, well, let good things happen, especially if you go look at their rosters and you see both those teams are loaded at quarterback. Don't bother making a move. Stay right there, you know, or at the very least, go into it thinking, I'm going to see how the board falls before I trade. 
don't get too eager. Remember, if, if there's a nice offer, use your imagination as to what good things could happen to you at that pick before you push accept. And you know, more often than not, if you don't accept and you wait until you're on the clock, you're going to get a better offer. Or something is going to happen that you didn't expect, and you're going to have a bluebird just come, 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 fall under uh, your fly lap. down and perch on your shoulder. That's the same manager that took Zach Wilson, Kenny Pickett, Bryce Young <laughs> the last three years, and they're staring at the Drake May versus Malik Neighbors, and they're terrified to pull the trigger on a QB. Sure. I, th- I think we, we have to kind of get away from the fact that we're drafting scared. A lot of people draft scared. They're scared to draft QBs because we've seen when QBs fail how quickly teams will give up on them now and how quickly their dynasty market falls. Well, of course, unless your name is Justin Fields, he's still worth the first for a lifetime. So uh, that one still is dumbfounds me. But I think people feel receivers are safer, Matt. Malik Neighbors, even if he doesn't become Jamar Chase, if he just becomes, you know, an, a thousand yard receiver, he's safe. I'm not going to bust. But what did you get if you get a receiver that goes 80 for a thousand and six touchdowns? Sounds a lot like, what, 14 points per game, that there's only about 30 I'm players really that can enough. do that year after year <laughs> after year. So it feels like you'd rather not bust, but I think it's going to lead to a lot of people. There's going to be a bust QB in this draft. There just is. Number, the, the odds say one of them is going to bust. But there's a good chance that one of them is way better than what the market is feeling right now. And they're going to pass on Drake May or they're going to pass on J.J. McCarthy for Roma Dunze, and then he's going to become – the next Drake London, and he's just a wide receiver too that has some sex appeal, and then it fades away after two years. Yep. And there's going to be people that wish they took the quarterback. So I just, it's interesting that we, we overcorrect because we've had some, a lot of QB whiffs over the last three rookie drafts. And now we don't like this QB class, even though the NFL is going to tell you it might be one of the best we've seen in the last decade. And one of the best wide receiver classes, comparing this wide receiver class to 2014. Do you guys remember who the first wide receiver drafted in 2014 was? No. In the NFL draft? Sammy in the Watkins? NFL draft. Sammy Watkins. Sammy Watkins. If I told you that, you know, Roma Dunze had a career similar to Sammy Watkins, would you be that surprised? I, if you polled that, 90% of people would say he's a bust. But, like, Sammy Watkins was a good, he was a good receiver. <laughs> yeah. He had injuries. But you look at his career and you're like, he had multiple fantasy relevant seasons. That's right. And people go, oh, very, his, his second year in Buffalo was very efficient, too. He was, he, he was I thought he was off to the races after that second year, but not so much. Uh but yeah, after that after that second year in, in Buffalo, man, his trade value was sky high also. So it sounds like you guys also we were talking about, you know, uh, the the value of the running back position. The, the, there's so few that are, you know, true difference makers. And there are a couple of young ones that are, right? And you mentioned Brees Hall earlier, B. John Robinson. I mean, how much Bijan and Brees Hall do you guys have right now, and how much do you want? I mean, I'll, I'll make this quick. I, I think that there are haves and have-nots at running back. I think if I have Bijan, if I have Brees, if I have Gibbs, if I have A-Chain, if I'm completely greedy like Clay and I have all four in a league. Now, if I have one of those guys, I'm probably just looking to hero RB it around them. I don't need any other running back equity. If I have Brees Hall, I don't want another running back in the top 30 if I can sell him for a first or two seconds or I can turn him into receiver value, future pick value. You know, I, At that point, if I have Zach Moss, James Conner, Joe Mick, I, I'll sell them all. I'm banking on the hero RB. I think there's five running backs that can be true difference makers, probably four if you remove A-Chain because he's very polarizing. And so if I have one of those guys, like you almost get them at all costs but you supplement some of that value you paid to get them by getting rid of a lot of the other running back value on your team. So it's, it's either you build it one way or you build it the other way. There's no in between. Yeah. I like to have two. So if you're talking about the, the breeze types, yes, it's more so of a build around hero RB. That's, that's how I like to do it too. It is nice when you have like a running back two is like Pacheco and then you can have some other trash that you can work with. What is it? April 2nd as the, time we're streaming this so breeze let's just take breeze as an example so with any stud whether it's running back wide receiver or a first 
I want to get, you know, a Garrett Wilson, let's say, is in the conversation on the other side. So those are the kinds of trades that I want to make. But then if somebody doesn't want to buy a running back, then I'm not going to be able to get those wide receivers, right? In which case they end up being kind of more like a hold, like the quarterbacks were. But in the meantime, they could score a bunch of points on my team. And maybe they'll be more flexible and, and desirable during the season. But I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not spending a young wide receiver to get them myself oftentimes unless I have, you know, an embarrassment of riches in, in that position. So it's it's a tough, you know, it's tough, man. You either you either get them in a, in a rookie draft, taking them as a startup or you're paying. I happen to get them really cheap in that OG league, super cheap, like 110 plus. I don't know, maybe a second, some piece, but that's where I'm at with the with the hammers. I'll just put this out there for everybody because the the one beauty that I don't think Clay realizes, and I shouldn't say this because I'm actively trying to trade for one of these running backs on that league with Clay. The fact that you have all four, you have neutered the entire running back landscape in the league. That advantage alone, everyone else is playing in a different positional pool than you. That alone is probably worth more than what you're being offered. So I shouldn't tell you that because I'm trying to buy one from you. But the fact that you have them all, like the running back pool has basically been deflated 40% because they're all on your roster. Everyone else is playing in like double A baseball while you're Mm -hmm. in the major leagues. So yeah, you may lose some value over time. One of those guys may get hurt in three years. One of them might be Jonathan Taylor. One might be close to out of the league, but you know what? For a nice short period of time, maybe two, three years, we are all literally blocked out <laughs> of the running back landscape. That That's probably worth a first round pick alone for somebody in the league to pay you to break up that break stack. That. So that's part of what I'm trying to do by trading for one of them is actually helping the rest of the league out even more than I'm helping me because I think it's uh, you really have it cornered and it's a huge advantage. So kudos to you for doing that. Yeah, so basically, I I feel like Clay is living in the capital of Panem, (laughs) and everyone else in the league is in the running back Hunger Games. That's what you're saying. That's a good feeling, man. You you have the hammer. You can come down on it at any time. It's pretty cool. Another question. Give me a receiver that is young but is being looked past that could have a one of those 20 point years this season that you guys like 20 that is big I top so. year. give it big I, I give me give me a, a you know has to be uh, pre apex like you know, younger than say age 27 who you think could have a big pop year this year i I want to get more DK Metcalf, and I think he's right under that that age threshold. I think he's overlooked, and he's always the type who, you know, again, he can go out there week one, week two, whatever it is, and have seven catches for 215 yards and two touchdowns, something, you know, something bonkers, and then he's a live asset again. So he's a uh, he's a likable guy, and historically he puts up decent decent numbers. Is he replaceable? Hell yeah, he's replaceable. But I just like the narratives that surround him. Uh, so I'd be I'd be picking DK Metcalf. He came to mind at least. I think there's three. Two of these guys are pretty highly valued. One of them's a little polarizing, but I think there's three. If you could look right now at receivers that are outside of the top eight that you could look up and say scored 20 points or more per game. Uh, I think Drake London's one. That's obvious. Probably a small percentage. I was hoping, yeah, that's 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 the one you weren't allowed to say. Yeah, that's the one where you look up and you go, if you know, he went 100 for 1,510 touchdowns, I wouldn't be shocked. He's got Kirk Cousins. He's got everything going for him. It's make or break. Uh, I think the other one, even though this guy has been good, not great, but I think he's also a victim of being very good early. And then kind of getting neutered a little bit by Tyreek. I think Jalen Waddle's another one. He's a Tyreek sure. injury away from looking up like, all right, this guy scored 21 a game. Now, does that mean that he's going to do that consistently? No, but I think the situation is set up. The target concentration there, they don't use a third receiver. I mean, they play them, but they don't target them. So Waddle's another one. And then I think the third one that people might be saying. No, 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 that was wrong. I had the wrong, I had the wrong sound effect. What did Dang, I do? Just the you were looking for the opposite. Oh, that was the wrong one. No, that was, that was, that was a 
mistake. God damn it. What am I? I'm getting sob. Oh, God. We will clean that up in post production for the podcast. That's a that was a big that was probably one of my greatest errors as a producer ever, where I started the wrong sound effect. That's the correct answer. I was hoping one of you would say Waddle. Tank Dell's the third. Ooh, very low percentage, Whoa. but I, you know what? They they don't draft a receiver, and I would be willing to bet one of their receivers hits close to that number. And that's just riding the passing efficiency and volume of Stroud. That's it. Doesn't mean Tank Dell's anything special, but the situation could line up for a year where he approaches that. I mean, and, and that when you can put up numerous games of 30 points or more in a week, I think the average could get close. So those let's, would be the three. Let's say, let, sorry, I have a question real quick. Let's say Nico Collins and oh. Tank Dell, they both go out there and literally both put up eight for 100. Okay, and a touchdown. Same exact stat line. Who who do you want? And then they do something very very similar in week two and week three. Both. Who does the market? Who does the market want? Yeah, I know both, right? But it's you have completely different body types, and there's more polar polarization. I'd say what on on the Dell side, maybe. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, yeah, I want them both as well, but I lean Nico. Just I, I will say this with Nico. The one scary thing for Nico is third-year breakout. That's a scary thing. The draft, but he's going to survive the draft. You'll know if he survived the draft or not. I think the other thing to pay attention with Nico is I. there's a very real possibility they don't pay Nico. Hmm. Look at the receiver prices. He's a free agent after this year. He Ridiculous. probably gets a franchise. I, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't necessarily want these guys that are getting tagged. It just creates a weird vibe between the player and the team. I, can they be good? Yes. But are they going to absolutely smash? I don't know. I'd still lean Dell. I would take the guy who has role. been a, the, uh, a consistent producer for fantasy football every year of, of his NFL career. Tank Dell. <laughs> Tank Dell. So that's yeah. Tank Dell. So that's that's that and and I wouldn't have said this a year ago, but he he's he's broken he he, he broke the glass ceiling for small receivers and some very happy. Matt he did Kelly that. is in on a hundred and sixty five pound twenty four year old rookie receiver that didn't get first two round draft capital. It's crazy, Wait, isn't it? What have we gone? It's to? wild. Yeah, I'm I'm in. I'm in. There's like I said, I'm open to uh, unprecedented player profiles ending up on my dynasty teams. I'm very open to that, and I'm open yeah. to changing assumptions about players. If you're not, you're doing it wrong. So, and ACLs. About- Who cares about ACLs anymore? It's it's like the same thing. Like the size of a wide receiver. It's like oh, toward ACL, no, no big deal, no big deal. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. So, <laughs> another question: What about the the value of tight end premium? Uh. How how do you factor that in when you're when you're in a league that's tight end premium versus not tight end premium? I mean, is that the difference between taking shots on fringe tight ends and not? Scott, you want to go first? Let me take this one just because I got a lot of thoughts on it. So tight end premium really doesn't matter except for the league mates that you're with. Think it matters Uh, until you get to like one seven five or beyond. You don't ever want to flex tight ends unless you have one of the top six seven eight. So I think there's a specific way to construct around that. Meaning if I can kind of play a little keep away like Clay's doing with the running backs and I can secure two top 10 tight ends, I don't care about the premium because there's a little extra value that I'm getting by kind of changing the landscape of the position. But most of the time, people aren't going to value tight ends in those leagues. So if I have what I would assume is an adequate tight end room, like I have zero interest on making the, the bet on Brock Bowers. And then there's leagues where I go, you know what? If I do make this bet, there's a little fallback value if it doesn't work out. You know, what if Brock Bowers is not the next Travis Kelsey and he's just a solid tight end? In a two PPR tight end premium, there's probably somebody that'll still buy back at 90% of what I paid, 85% of what I paid. So I, the point is I got to know my market, but most likely people are going to over adjust. I'm very stringent. Anybody that's listened to my roster construction series, I am very stringent on not rostering more than two tight ends in yeah. any league that has a lineup and less than one seven, five premium. So to answer your question, Matt, if I have a, let's say I have Trey McBride and Noah fan, that's my two tight ends. 
I have zero interest in carrying a third. I have zero interest in drafting your favorite tight end, not yours, but just the person's favorite, Jaheim Bell or mm-hmm. Ben Sanat. He's been getting some buzz, right? Like, I, I'm not wasting rookie <laughs> picks on those types Terrible. of players. That it, you're just pissing them away. I'd rather trade my 305 for a future third so I can use the third during the season than I would to draft Cade Stover. There's just, it, you're clogging my roster. So that's very, very, very straightforward. Do not waste picks on any time, especially this class. It's easy to fade. That's the thing about a third round pick. The reason you flip a third rounder this year for a third rounder next year, even though technically the third rounder this year has more value because you could actually use it on a player that can help you at some point in the season. You do it because, yeah, maybe you didn't get the offer you wanted on the third rounder this year. You could get an offer you like next year. You Mm -hmm. put that pick in your pocket just in case. Just in case you you uh, are able to use it uh, in a way that you weren't able to use it the previous year, just roll it over, man. Roll those picks over. So I'm what I'm hearing is you're going Roma Dunze over Brock Bowers and drafts. Period. The only exception would be if you have a barren tight end room, and I'm not super polarized on Brock Bowers, so like I'm not going to sit here and say he is the next difference maker. I think that's a very dangerous game to just assume. He's a top three tight end, and that's where he's already being valued. But, but Matt, if I said I have no good tight ends and I value a positional advantage, I'm okay making them bet. Okay. Because the alternative okay. bet on a Dunze is what? He's a 14-point-per-game receiver. You know, that's Watkins, not a guarantee. Man. Yeah, that's not a guarantee. Would you, would, so uh, all else equal, J.J. McCarthy or Roma Dunze? Man, that's that's a close one. I, that's I why think I asked the question. For me. You come here I'm... to answer tough questions. <laughs> that's what we're here for. I'm, I'm leaning. <laughs> I am leaning JJ, but I, it comes down to my league. What is my league economy? I got. Can we that. get this fucking uh, production board sound effects to work properly? <laughs> <laughs> Now we're cooking with gas. I'm loving life. I'm loving life. Okay. Next question. Running back. Are you drafting a running back at the end of the first round? In Superflex? Probably in some cases. Probably in some cases. We know there's going to be a couple that that pop, and it, we play in a uh, lot There's going to be more than that. There's going to be at least four running backs yeah. in this class that pop, at least, in the, in their rookie year. Yeah, there's gonna be more than that that pop throughout the the course of their careers. Sure, first round is is tough. We do play in a lot of point per carry leagues, so that inflates them a bit. But uh, I guess I am not drafting running backs as much. Or I'm sorry, I am going the first round without a running back more so than I'm drafting a running back. Let's say that. But yes, I will have a couple leagues where I take one. Yeah, same. I think the the ADP will end up shaking out where there is a running back that sneaks into the first, maybe two. Uh, right now, there's not because no one knows who it is. And they don't know there's where they're getting drafted. Five, hey, there, yeah, there's four, five, six candidates, and there's three or four landing spots, and nobody knows anything, so they're scared to death to put you know, Jalen Wright, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, Blake Corm, whoever you like, they're scared to go, ah, man, what if he's drafted in the third? And you know, I saw a mock the other day, Jalen Wright to Miami in the third. People would be terrified. Man, there's too many comp, too much competition yep. there. Oh, I would love that. You know? But then you look at it and you go, why would they draft Jalen Wright? It's probably to play same type of role that they already have. Like it, you, you know what I mean? Like it, it would be a spot where people would like, but not enough to push them into the first round. So I think people are just hesitant. They're willing to jam in 15 receivers into the first two rounds of rookie drafts. No joke. Like give me every receiver. Realizing. 75% of them are a sub 14 points per game or less. So I, just, have, I, have, I have to get you guys out of draft. here. I know I got to get you guys out of here. We got, we got almost no time. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep this very quick. Any running backs, any fringe running backs in the, in the later rounds you're circling. Rookie drafts or vets? Rookie drafts. Man, Clay, you got any? Cause I got like 20. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would go uh, Bucky Irving. I'll I'll still be on the uh, on the Bucky Irving train. 
Well, you already mentioned Dylan Lobb. That's one. Uh, I think there's a few others. Tyler Dylan Lobb is a is a lob. It's a slam dunk, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Tyrone Tracy is another one that's been getting a little bit of buzz. Oh wow! Uh, I'm with Ray. I'm with Ray a lot on Will Shipley's probably Shipley. undervalued. <laughs> Will Shipley's definitely undervalued, and I think there's. It, it depends on again your roster build, but there's going to be a lot of shots that you can take. Kendall Milton is another one that I kind of like. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but there, there's going to be a ton. Kamani Vidal, I got to interview him at the Senior Bowl. There it is. Great, great kid. That's another there one that I'll be taking. Uh, but the beauty, you already talked about it earlier, Matt, the beauty of taking these guys, you get immediate outcomes. They don't make a roster out of training camp, gone, off my team. Like they, I don't wait. You draft that fifth-round receiver, you draft Jalen McMillan because you loved him as a Devi prospect. Guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna you're gonna hold him for two years. You're setting the pick on fire. You're, yeah. you're hopium because you're not gonna have. I still see people rostering Kayshawn Boutte. Oh, for sure. Ah, man, let's give him another year. You know, at that point, you're actually hurting yourself by making the pick because you're wasting a roster spot for multiple years. Kamani Vidal, I'm gonna know. Oh, the buzz in camp. Oh, that's my guy. I will know. So, yeah, there's a bunch of guys. Isaiah Davis is another one. Rasheen Ali got hurt at the Senior Bowl, left. No one's really talked about him, but he's another one. I mean, there's there's a ton of names. That are Why would you draft wide receivers late in rookie drafts when you have all these names? Yes, and so I love this idea of, of just lighting these picks on fire because we have the sound effect. <laughs> Remember, we used the, we, you heard it earlier. Here's the We have the perfect sound effect for this. I mean, that's yes, it. That's that good. is the sound effect of lighting picks on fire. Okay, I'll get you out of here. Bold prediction from each. Clay, go first. Bold prediction, just rookie draft wise. Just anything. Just give me anything. Oh gosh. Any uh, prediction of what happens? You know, landing spot of a player. It, it, you know, this running back becomes the first running back off the board. Whatever. I don't know what it is because uh, he landed it in such a great spot. Who knows? Do you have one in the hopper, Scott? For some reason, I don't know what it is. Maybe lack of food or something. Do you have one in, in your uh, lack of in your food? Head? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't eaten. Oh, enough. Clay. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm hangry or Get something. This man, some nourishment. That's right. I'm. I'm helping to. Uh, so basically, what, what, what we do, what, what we we call this in the in the broadcasting biz, is what I'm doing is I'm filibustering. Filibustering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm no, filibustering I'll, 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 here. So what I'm talking. I'm. I'm, 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 I'm using up airtime to give you and Scott more time to consider what your bold prediction might be. There's a lot of possible. Like you could say. Uh, oh, a bold prediction would be that uh, yet last week Cody Carpentier said that the Cardinals would actually represent the NFC in the Super Bowl, uh, that Kyler Murray will be the MVP. You could say something wild and crazy like uh, Marvin Harrison will be a top three receiver in all of fantasy. Uh, th- there's a lot of things. Uh, and, I'll say, uh, and I like my, mine might be, I, I got one, I got one for you. So I'll say, you know, a fun one, uh, would be, oh, because remember we talked about, uh, you know, the, the new, uh, um, injuries and the new assumptions around injuries that, uh, Jonathan Brooks will be a top five running back in the second half of 2024. Nice. It was something nice. like that. Like that would I'll be bold. I'm not Will saying Levis. that's my bold prediction. I'm just saying that eight. would be said. This is what they call in the business a filibuster by the host. Will Levis top eight quarterback. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. I, instead of a QB one, I was like, that was it, let's perfect. Make it top eight. Let's make it top eight. Yeah, why not? Make it hot. Make it bold. All right, Scott, take us out. This is going to be the year where we leave the 2024 season questioning everything we think we know about wide receivers and all of your teams that are built around a bunch of these so-called threshold receivers. I mean, I don't know how many times we said 14 points per game. You're going to be questioning everything you know about the receiver landscape as soon as we start 2025. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.